Okay, we're going to try this non-live. Um, this is uh, for Parashat Vayikra. Uh, the year is 5780. Uh, there's a lot going on. This coronavirus scare and now pandemic has uh, created massive upheaval around the world here in Israel and in America. Uh, I thank God that I live here. The situation in New York, uh, which I left uh, a few weeks ago, has uh, vastly deteriorated. Uh, whereas in Israel, it seems to be mostly under control. Uh, the Lord is protecting his people, but it's still the economic damage and the social damage, or hopefully just the social and economic effects, have not yet been felt, but we're waiting to see them. Uh, and we hope that with God's help, we'll get through this. Uh, meanwhile, there's some interesting halakhic issues that are coming up. Uh, the first one was that uh, a group of Rabbanim have put out an official... Uh, ruling uh, allowing families to connect, uh, members of the families to connect with each other's Passover seders uh, using certain uh, technologies. Uh, they used Zoom. Zoom is the popular one, but I, I assume that the halacha would recognize any and all uh, similar applications. For example, uh, Google Hangouts, Skype, uh, Facebook, YouTube. There are all ways to uh, connect people live and in video. Uh, of course, there are a lot of issues involved. Um, one of the things is that this is mostly a public policy issue. I and others, uh, I, I, others, other actual post game, I have just uh, someone who's publicizing these things, pointed out that it's high time that mainstream Judaism greatly reconsider the assumed uh, prohibition of using electricity on Shabbat and especially Yom Tov, which uh, should be even more lenient. And uh, that's basically the issue. It's not uh, whether or not this is, has to do with anything. And of course, the public policy issue is, is uh, perhaps of paramount importance. We allow this. There might not be uh, Shabbos remaining. There are many, many youth, when they first rebel, uh, what, how do they rebel by violating Shabbos? Oh, they... Uh, they play with their phones on Shabbos, and someone should tell them, thank God, that technically is not, not so much of a chil Shabbos. Writing on the screen, yeah, maybe, if you consider that a Rabbanon, it's not even, perhaps even the rabbis wouldn't consider that writing. So we not just have to consider this sock itself, but perhaps consider everything else, consider what, maybe we have to rethink this entire thing. The problem is that we're very conservative with a lowercase c, not capital C, we're a very conservative uh, religious group, and therefore that which is new is either uh, some just take the approach of it must be forbidden, or at least very suspect. And uh, hopefully we'll get over this. I have seen now some of Rav Shachter's Psakim. Uh, it's very good that uh, Rabbi Student has posted them on his blog. Uh, I thought we'd review some of them or just uh, comment on them. Uh, of course, Rav Shachter is completely reliable. Uh, here in Israel, though, I would I would imagine that uh, his his except for certain American enclaves, his opinions are not generally followed because he's in America, and the Israeli rabbanim uh, are more followed here in Israel, certainly among the Sephardic groups. Um, so we we should get to that and see that that uh, this actually has effects on what we're going to do. Um, I do believe that. I personally would not tell people to tune in on Zoom. Um, I don't know their particular cases. If their Rav has uh, allowed them to do so, that's fine. But I don't think that's a solution. I don't think it would be a good seder. I think that uh, just like we have been trapped without going to synagogue and going to our study halls, we've been socially isolated, we'll just have to go through the seder also like this. We should understand that this is uh, God's will. Uh, I cannot imagine a seder going on with Zoom. Uh, in any normal manner. Uh, I want I would like to hear from people who actually take advantage of this psaac and see how it went. Perhaps if it does work out well, and they're able to do exactly as uh, the Rabbanim said by configuring everything beforehand and just leaving the connection open, it's uh, the practicality of it is, is unimaginable. But if it works, I'd like to hear how it went, but I, I would certainly not recommend it for anybody in particular. Now let's... Uh, for the good of everybody, let us uh, see what Rav Schechter has mentioned here. He talks about uh, immersing new uh, kalim. New kalim are new uh, 
implements, anything, any vessels, or anything else used with the direct handling of food. So forks and knives, etc., are not vessels, but they're also halachically kalim. That's why I use the word implement. Uh, and when a Jewish person acquires such a thing, if they were not created by a Jew, or if they were ever in possession of a Gentile along the way, however they got to him, uh, he has to immerse them in a mikvah. This is not talking about uh, the halachic purging of forbidden tastes from food that was already used. We're talking about even new kalim. New kalim have to be dunked in the mikvah if they were along the way owned by a non-Jew or if they were created by a non-Jew. If Let's say it's a Jewish manufacturer and all the middlemen along the way were Jews until the Jew bought it, so these things would not have to be immersed anyways. And he's explaining uh, the various ways that people could get, uh, you should be know that you could dunk these things in natural bodies of water. Sometimes you don't really have access to those. There are other things, Allah will mikveh, uh, you know, there is a technical thing. There is a way, this is very, don't do this at home, but technically speaking, you can convert a home bathtub into a mikvah if you rely on certain opinions. I have never been happy with the expression, well, you have to rely on leniencies. Perhaps the leniencies are correct. Just because something is a leniency doesn't mean it shouldn't be relied upon. And that's a fallacy that people make all the time. Or Schechter himself has pointed this out. You should actually uh, uh, make a, an attempt to discover what the halakhic truth is. Uh, the Rambam and the Vilna Gon would never look at something and say, oh, well, this is leniencies or relies on leniencies. Yikov adina tahar. Let the, let the law uh, cleave the mountain. If it's correct, it's correct. Even if it does happen to be lenient or it even uses a few leniencies, if they're correct, then let it be. He then talks about a leniency uh, here that one uh, gives up ownership of these kalim. If something is not owned, Entirely, that means it's not his. He doesn't have to dunk it if it still belongs to the Gentile. So he could either give it as a Gentile to a gift, but the Gentile lets him use it in his house. Remember, the Gentile's not actually using this for non-kosher food, so it doesn't really become a kosherous issue. Or he could somehow renounce his ownership, and he gives ways to do that. So that's an interesting idea. Uh, he talks about the fast of the firstborn. The firstborn, there's a... The Shulchan Ar talks about how the firstborn have a custom to fast on Erev Pesach, and if they attend a uh, sudat mitzvah, which means uh, uh, a meal that is a mitzvah to perform for a simcha of some sort, so then they have to eat then, and then they've eaten, and they broke their fast. So they, uh, he gives the various uh, kulas that have been used before, people participating in smachot long distance, once again, using the phone or the internet and the various technologies. I know people have done that. I used to joke that uh, this actually should not be, it's a little bit incorrect. It shouldn't be that the firstborn have a custom to fast because no one actually ends up fasting. Everybody says, oh, they're going to, they almost have to fast, but then they manage to go to the siyum, the, the, the celebration of completing uh, a, a course of study, usually a Talmudic tractate or an order of the Mishnah. And because they eat there, now they're uh, off the hook. So no one ends up fasting, so I should say, more accurately, the firstborn have a custom not to fast. I like to point out the opinion of Maimonides, as popularized by Rav Kappa. I don't think, well, actually, it's a bad word, popularized, because it's not popular. It's very unwell known. But uh, it is very unclear from the Talmud if this is a Talmudic practice at all. The Vilgon points out that there's a story that uh, Rabbi Yudah Nasi himself or others were fasting on uh, Erev Pesach. Some point out it's because oh they're firstborn. See, there's a this is a this is a source that firstborns fasted on Erev Pesach, and others say no. Uh, like Rambam himself says, you're not supposed to eat a lot the afternoon of Passover, so you eat matzah with an appetite, and this is part of a much bigger sugya. What exactly should one do the afternoon of Passover? What can one eat? What should one eat? What can't one eat? And Maimonides' opinion and the Vilna opinion is that not that just one should avoid matzah, because there's a prohibition of eating matzah the of Pesach, but any matzah product, or even matzah shiro, is included. Most people generally don't hold that. And one can't eat chametz, and one can't establish a meal. So what should one eat? Basically, next to nothing, Pesach afternoon. He basically, Rambam says, the, the Talmud Chacham would starve themselves, uh, or they would make themselves hungry. Mar'ivin, that's the word mar'iv, from the word starving, or famine, on uh, Erev Pesach. And 
The others, the, the what I would call the mainstream opinion, the one that you find that Tosafists and other subsequent poskim, and including the Shulchan Aruch and all the related codes, is that you're not supposed to eat a full meal, but you could eat other things Erev Pesach. So their approach to this is entirely different, uh, and that would explain why it is you found. Uh, according to the way the Rambam and Vilna go and read this, you'd find why it is that people were fasting Erev Pesach, not because they're firstborn. Everybody was sort of fasting. Uh, be that as it may, Rav Kapach points out that the Rambam says, but you still have to eat something that morning. You cannot fast on Erev Pesach because it is a holiday for everybody. It's the day that a, cor- a special korban was brought in the base of Mikdash. It's actually Chag Pesach, according to uh, according to the Torah, is the 14th of Nisan. Chag HaMatzot is the 15th. Uh, and that's what we call Pesach. So one, no one should be fasting ever on Erev Pesach, according to this approach. And that's a sniff l'hakel, as they call it. That's another consideration for leniency. Uh, many would say, like Rav Kabach, no, that, that is, no one should be fasting, period. So uh, just be aware of that especially for those who are ill, those who have difficulty, those who cannot find the seum, just to know if you don't eat, uh, you have who to rely on, Rambam himself. He mentions a thing about selling the chametz here, uh, about appointing the Rav. There is a custom that uh, one who intends to sell his chametz, remember, if, if you hold of these chametz sales, uh, does the whole thing, picking up the, the rabbi's handkerchief or pen and making an acquisition, etc., and appointing the rabbi as one's emissary to sell his chametz to the non-Jew. Uh, we sell things online nowadays. We, we have actual kinyonim of thousands and thousands of dollars using online technology. So this is a little bit antiquated, but there were those who, were, who had this stringency. They never heard about this. Uh, Talmudically, so they never did it. They never did a sell self chametz, and even when they did these things, appointing emissaries, they did not do the whole thing with the with the handkerchief or the pen. It's certainly not a Maimonidean thing. He brings up the Chazanish, and others didn't do it. Uh, so this year, we're going to sell our chametz differently. If you actually even intend to sell your chametz, of course, the best thing is to dispose of chametz. And there, he talks about, by the way, uh, burning chametz. Burning chametz is something not something that's not the smartest thing. We usually have public burnings, so that could work, but nowadays you can't gather, and if you try to burn your house, you're not going to actually end up burning it the right way, and it, it's dangerous. So he says you should do what the sages of the Mishnah would do, and there are other ways to dispose of chametz. You could throw it at the dumpster the day before, and that's totally fine. Taking your chametz and just throwing it in the dumpster is totally valid, but he says if you want to do exactly as the sages did, so you grind it up and throw it into the water or throw it to the air, or just... Uh, grind it up even smaller and flush it down the toilet. Bread will can flush the toilet if it's sufficiently uh, ground up. Just don't destroy your toilet or th- uh, whatever. There's other ways to dispose of chametz. It would be chasidut uh, shtut, foolishness. Okay? It would be a, a foolish piety to insist on burning one's chametz uh, and creating the danger of doing that. Don't do backyard bonfires. I know of someone who tried to do that once a neighbor, and he lit his backyard on fire, and it spread through all the backyards, and nearly got to my house, so please don't do that. Uh, he talks about koshering the dishwasher. Uh, I don't have much to say about that, except for that that's assuming the dishwasher does get infected, so to speak, with the non-kosher taste, with, or with the chametz stick tastes, uh, as been pointed out by Rav Lior and others, beginning with Rabbi Antelman, and continue Rabbi Bar Chaim. The surgical steel that they use, the stainless steel, does not have bleas. And not only that, it's pogamized, as the OU itself would do. If you always run your dishwasher with those uh, cleansers, then the dishwasher itself never absorbs forbidden tastes. It says you run it on a full cycle with hot water, okay? Uh, here in Israel, the dishwashers, also the, the European dishwashers, heat their own water. I checked, they only go, go up to 65 degrees Celsius. That's not super hot. That's not as hot as, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know how hot you can make your boiler in America. But that should be hot enough for koshering, even if you assume it absorbs anything. So I think that there's a lot more leniency here uh, based on the Metzius, on the reality. Dishwashers don't impart taste. You can test this yourself by, for example, my dishwasher. You could, I don't know, cook it, cook pasta. Everything is hot. Chumet stick pasta and threw a load of dishes in there and, and then wash them and then take brand new dishes and wash them inside the dishwasher and you will find that they have not absorbed any taste whatsoever. 
So that is a proof that the dishwasher is kosher for everything. Not only that, most of the things we put in our dishwasher are also, like I said, stainless steel or glass or forms of stainless steel and glass. They do not absorb taste anyways. Even if you'd wash them with pig in the same pot, they never absorb taste. Now you could do try this at home. Take your stainless steel super duper kitchen knives and use them to cut steak or use, them, use uh, some to cut cheese. Wash them with hot water and soap and then use them to cut up onions. Okay, do a double blind test, cut up a bunch of par of onions, and see, and you can test with the others, see if any of the onions taste any differently. If any of them have, have cheese taste or meat taste, it just does not happen. It's not a thing. So we, we have a lot of leniency in this regard. Uh, he talks about Minhagia Tsibur, specifically, people have all sorts of uh, stringencies that they keep on Passover. Uh, I would imagine that he's talking here about Gabrachts, because I heard him give the shir about that. There are people who don't eat Gabrachts, but now they, uh, Gabrachts means the matzah products. They use matzah, they wet the matzah, or they grind the matzah. The matzah meal use that. Many people have this very late custom uh, not to eat Gabrachts. Um, and kitnios is an even more prominent one. Uh, people don't eat kitnios, period, even though, as we've said many times, uh, if you follow, let's say, just the Ramah and the Chayadam, the Ramah is talking about cooked dishes of kitnios. And that's pointed out by the, the Chayadam that, technically speaking, kitnios can be kosher if you just don't make them into what's called a tavshil. You make them into matzah. Or you eat them before they're small, like you eat your peas in the pod, you eat your corn on the cob. That was never kitnios to begin with. But uh, he says, he makes that distinction. Uh, is it What's the extent of the, the minhag? Is it a personal minhag? Is it a community minhag? But not only that, some people keep it as stringency, or is it just... Uh, a, a fallacious minhag. The Vilna Gon, for example, uh, apparently, like I wrote last year, the Vilna Gon felt that the Gabrachts not eating matzah products was fool, was foolishness. He just didn't care for that. But Kidneyos was a serious one they, that he took. Apparently, he wanted to get out of Kidneyos by making Aliyah. And that would have done it. If he just moved somewhere else, he didn't have to keep that. And, uh, I'll explain my logic beforehand. Uh, you could also check where Barchim said. So the problem with these is that when it comes to any particular stringency, some will say that's a real legitimate stringency, and therefore, in order to get out of it, you can't, or you'd have to uh, annul your vow, so to speak, go in front of a rabbinic court and ask to be uh, exempted from this. And if it's not legitimate, then you just have to drop it because it's a minhag shtut, once again. The problem is that there's no consensus. For example, uh, the whole Gabrach's thing. So the Vilna Gon thought it was Minak Shtut, but you have all these Hasid Sharebis who say it's the most important thing in the world. So they would, I guess, would say you have to do a Tars Nadarim, but then they'd say, no, everybody does it, it's a communal Minhag, so you can't get out of there. So it really depends on you asking. The same thing with, with uh, the Kitneus thing. Rav Kapach has wrote, wrote this very clearly based on the older Rishonim and the Gonim, who first knew about the Minhag to not eat the uh, Tafshilin of the Kitneus, and uh, he, he basically says that everybody can still eat them. There is no problem. It was, it was a mistake to begin with. And that's what Rabbi Barachim has publicized. Yet others have said, no, it's legitimate. There is uh, some reason to want to uh, keep this, this custom. Okay, so I guess you just have to see what your local Orthodox uh, Machmir has to say about that because there is no consensus. I, I haven't found a single minhag even when people are saying that, oh yeah, that this is just something that people do, you could give that up, then there are those who say, no, it's legitimate, you can't just give it up. And even if they say, there's, even though the Shulchan Aruch says, so the way out is Hatar Snodarim, there's some say, even that is too much because you can't do it. I don't know what to tell you, so uh, good luck. Uh, he mentions here Bir Chametz, okay. And uh, he mentions here, Finally, we must also be careful of the public perception that Jews are going about their business as usual and conducting their affairs in public while the rest of the world is confined to themselves to their homes. It could appear as if the Jewish people are not sharing the burden and pain with the rest of humanity because of our religion. Okay. So uh, you have to consider that. Here he talks about the Zoom Seder. Uh, once again, here is a... Here is a... He says it. However, to leave a computer screen on... That people watch and connect over to is greater concern of violating Shabbos and since it creates images and pictures when the people move. So he doesn't like that. Yeah, it creates images and pictures that's uh, prohibited by the rabbis. 
And that's what we have about the halachic issues that have come up this year. I hope that this year, uh, and I hope that this year somehow we get over these things and they become moot. I also hope that uh, by next year we have a lot more normal questions. I was really hoping this year we would talk about Haggadah to Pesach. Get ready for Korban Pesach. Here people are talking about they're not even going to have the Seder that we had last year. At least, even though we did not have Korban at least we had our family at the Seder. This year we're talking about we even have family. There's some people talking about we even have Maror. How we get our hands on these things. If they close down the country, who will go shopping for everybody? Week beforehand I heard this. I've been hearing rumors about this. That the army will deliver groceries to everybody. And... My children want to know what was that, what, what that was like. I remember back in uh, the dark times in the first intifada, uh, the joke was back in 2002. I think it was January 2002. Uh, they were they had Arafat Yimach Shemov Zichro uh, hold up in his compound in Ramallah, but they were delivering food to him. And uh, it says that they were giving him pitas, cucumbers, and tomatoes, cans of tuna, and some oranges and some basic stuff. And that reminded me of what we used to get in Yeshiva Thursday night. The Israelis would all pack out of campus. There was hundreds of them on the Yeshiva Hadarom campus. But then the first came the most Thursday nights. It was off and uh, just a, you know, a few dozen, or not even a few dozen, a dozen or so Americans left on campus. So they sent us food, you know, a pack of pitas, a few cans of tuna and some cucumbers and tomatoes. And uh, it was sort of humorous, and I'm telling my kids, that's why I can imagine that the army is going to be giving that out to people. Two bags of milk uh, every three days, and a frozen chicken, and uh, some very basic stuff that every family is going to get if they do go to complete lockdown. We need to talk about Haggadah to Pesach. We have to hold out hope. God will get us out of this. We'll be able to have Korban Pesach. That's what we should have done. Perhaps enough people will learn their lesson and realize, yeah... We were supposed to have Korban Pesach this year. We should have been planning for that. Instead of all these different trips, there are people who are going to go to Arizona. There are people who are going to go to Iceland. There are people who are going to go... Off. Why are you going to all these places? There are people who are going to go to Italy for Passover. There are people who are going to go to places that are Egypt. Now, not halakhically Egypt. The Rambam defines Egypt as you know a certain area that is more like ancient Egypt, but a big box, a big square. Uh, the Sinai Desert, even, it's not technically Egypt. You know, that's actually... But that they're going to recreate what our ancestors did. They're going to go uh, wander the Sinai Peninsula uh, and south of Eilat uh, on Passover. Hashem has prevented us from doing all these things. Why? Because we should have been getting ready for Korban Pesach. So let's talk a little bit about the Haggadah a little bit more. Last time we were talking about the, the prohibition of removing the Pesach from the room. I pointed out that that was in order to... Uh, because maybe you could bring it out of the house, but... It, the halacha is not so clear, so because we're dealing with an Isr do uh a biblical prohibition, out of out of doubt, we should uh, take a, uh, we should take uh, a strict approach, a stringent approach. Um, now we talked about how I left out halach ma'anya. I don't think it's right that we invite people to the seder. Uh, we've reinserted this line uh, that the child asks, "Why is it tonight we only eat roasted meat?" And uh, it's very interesting to know that the, the reason for the, the Torah's requirement that the Passover not be cooked or, or uh, boiled or cooked in any way but flame-roasted, and it has to be eaten that way, is in order to preserve the taste. It doesn't say in the Torah, the sages said that. The sages say this uh, group of commandments is to preserve the taste of the Korban Pesach. You're eating the Korban Pesach, you have to make it taste like a Korban Pesach, not anything else. Even though you're allowed to baste the meat of the Korban Pesach with it, whatever, and you're allowed to also, uh, you're allowed to, um, you could baste it, and you could also eat it with whatever else you want. You could put sauces, etc., on the Korban Pesach once you're eating it. Uh, if you actually cook it in a thing with sauce, then you've actually cooked your Pesach, and now it would be not kosher for consumption. Uh, years ago, I pointed out this Bavurzet. Go check the uh, my uh, video archives here and in Torah Box uh, for a nice word about how basically uh, how basically uh, the Korban Pesach uh, we mentioned here in the Haggadah it says Ba'avur Zeh and it mentions Matzah and Mara Munachim Lefanov the Matzah and the Mara are sitting in front of him 
uh, it doesn't mention Korm Pesach here. And it's because only Matz and Mar are actually Avur. Those actually grow from the ground. Uh, that's all we have for tonight. God willing, tomorrow before uh, Shabbos we'll upload a little bit more. And we'll say Shabbos also we'll talk more about the Agadah. Uh, wish all of you a Chag Kasher Sameach, Chodesh Tov, and a Shabbat Shalom.